Morning. Please come in. Find a seat. The uh, C-lect of the elect, I think, is <laughs> uh, what we are at the moment. But hopefully, more will come as they battle through the rain. Welcome to uh, this our fourth lecture of the 37th annual Moore College lectures. Uh, it's great that we can come together to uh, hear these um, profound truths that Professor Michael Horton is bringing to us on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Uh, my name's Ed Lone, if you don't know me, I'm new on faculty. Um, so just a warm welcome, especially if you're visiting us at college, it's great to have you join us uh, for these lectures. Um, so far this week, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. We've been given really a feast of um, delightful truths, stimulating and thought-provoking lectures uh, that have um, uh, caused a, a lot of discussion and uh, thinking about this topic that we're looking at. Uh, we looked at um, some neglected areas about the Holy Spirit. Michael reminded us that uh, the Holy Spirit is not just involved in recreation but in creation and not just transformation but he has a judicial role as well. And then of course yesterday uh, we looked at that epoch-changing event that happened at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out and, and dwells in believers now. A radical uh, change that has taken place and a blessing for all of us who believe. Uh, so we're going to uh, be continuing on uh, in our study of the Holy Spirit this morning. Um, but a couple of announcements before we get into that. So if you have a mobile phone, now is the time to turn it off or onto quiet including if you get emails and it bings for that. Uh, we know you're very important, but uh, we don't need to know how many emails you're getting throughout the whole talk. Um, uh, also, there, are, there is a question box uh, on the out, on the, at the doors on the outside, and there's little notes that you can write questions on. So please uh, do that, take that opportunity. If there's anything that uh, comes up through the talk, 
uh, then uh, write it down on a question, uh, as a question, put it in the box, and Michael will, uh, Professor Horton will um, hopefully get a chance to answer that. So after the talk today, he's going to be answering some questions uh, that were put in the box yesterday, and then if there's any more time, he may be uh, able to take some questions from the floor as well. So if you have a question from the talk, and there is time, uh, it's probably worth jotting that down to make it a pointed and uh, concise question rather than a vague and waffly one um, so that it's easier for him to answer. Okay, so with those uh, announcements out of the way, uh, we're going to be reading from God's Word now and Pete Orr is going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 4. So if you'd like to open up your Bibles, Pete will come up and read for us. Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have called, which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Having heard what God's word, uh, join me in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that you yourself dwell in us, and we thank you for what you've revealed about this truth through your word. And we pray now that as Professor Horton comes uh, to speak to us from this truth, that you'll be working in us, help us to receive uh, this doctrine well, and to transform our lives so that we might bear the fruit of the Spirit as we live. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, I'd like to, you, to invite you to join me in welcoming Professor Horton up. Thank you, Ed. And uh, whoever is, uh, uh, has anything to do with the weather, I just want to say it's inconsistent with all of the uh, publicity that... <laughs> that we've seen in California. Um, no, I'm actually enjoying this tremendously. I get to go back to an inferno uh, as it's summer uh, back home, so it's, I'm enjoying the rain. Uh, wonderful privilege to be able to come to you again today to uh, discuss further what it means to be recipients of the Spirit's outpouring at Pentecost. And uh, I'd like to direct your attention today to baptism with the Spirit uh, I had originally titled this, this The Gifts of the Spirit, but of course I discussed some of that yesterday. I will be discussing the gifts of the Spirit, but more central uh, in this talk is going to be baptism with the Spirit. What do we mean by baptism with the Spirit? Now one of the tragedies of prolonged debates over the Spirit's person and work is that the gifts become more important than the giver. The, the, the great gift at Pentecost is the Holy Spirit. 
uh, just as Jesus Christ is the gift par excellence who comes with his gifts of election, justification, sanctification, glorification. The Holy Spirit himself is the down payment. Uh, and so the giver is greater even than his gifts. The Spirit unites us to the whole Christ and therefore to all of the gifts that Christ has for us. He doesn't unite us to Christ the Savior without uniting us to Christ the Lord. And together with the Father, the Spirit gave us Jesus. Covered that a couple of days ago. Then trading places, Jesus gave us the Spirit. And now we explore how the Spirit gives us particular gifts as part of the gift, the baptism with the Spirit. First of all, it's important, uh, to, as I've been trying to uh, mark going along uh, the way, it's important to have a biblical theological background for all of the uh, systematic conclusions that we draw. Uh, that's, no, uh, that's no odd suggestion at more. And uh, consecration really is the background, the Old Testament background, for the uh, notion of holiness that I'll be unpacking today for baptism with the Spirit. Uh, I take it that under the Old Covenant, there were three categories for the status of people, places, and things. Corrupt, common, and holy. In fact, we could re reduce the categories, uh, the categories to two, the consecrated and the common, because the consecrated could lead to either destruction or deliverance. Uh, that which was under consecration, that is, that which was holy to the Lord, was holy to him either for death uh, or salvation. The terms don't refer in the first place to a moral quality, obedience or disobedience, but to a status, to a claim that God makes on persons, places, or things. Ordinary people, places, and things are elected by God as sites of his presence, not because of anything in them, but simply because of who he is. And so it's a status, holy to the Lord. For example, when human beings are involved, to be holy to the Lord is to be pl placed within the visible sphere of the covenant community where the Lord is active, where there is a, a holiness spread across the whole uh, realm that he rules. To reject the covenant's blessings is to be cut off, is to be excommunicated. In other words, if you're not devoted for salvation, you're devoted for destruction, but you're devoted. You're consecrated to the Lord, given to the Lord to belong to his covenant community, and so the whole earth and everything in it is under God's covenantal claim by right of creation. And yet, with the covenants of Abraham and then the covenant at Sinai, you have uh, different types of claims that God makes on people, places, and things. The exodus will cut away Israel from Egypt, and circumcision will cut away the foreskin, representatively of the passing down of sin, so that the whole person may be saved. Cut off a little bit so that the whole person can be saved. Once more in history, Yahweh claimed people, places, and things as his own, either for destruction or for deliverance. Canaan was his footstool. By itself, it was ordinary. It was no, not a, uh, no different as a plot of land uh, than any other part of the earth. And yet God claimed it as the stage for his dramatic parable, the play within the play of the story of redemption. And once again, this means that Yahweh will rule directly, as he did in the Garden of Eden, he will rule directly through his viceroy, uh, in this case, uh, Israel itself collectively, before Israel had a king. God will rule directly and immediately so that everything under his his immediate rule, not providence, but under his immediate rule, is holy unto him. 
By God's command and the presence of his spirit, Canaan is no longer a common land, but a holy land. And holy land means holy war. So now it's not the terms of just war, nations defending themselves, common nations defending themselves. Uh, it, it, God's ordinary providential laws and regulations are suspended in favor of harem, in favor of holy war for holy land. God is directly and immediately ruling as the king of Israel. In, in the other nations, they had their gods as witnesses to treaties. Only in Israel is the God the king, <laughs> the head of state. So God is directly ruling Israel, indirectly through providence in the other nations, directly and immediately giving Israel its rules and immediately judging uh, those who lead Israel and immediately giving his spirit to the prophets, uh, the priests, and the kings uh, eventually when Israel uh, has the kingship. So basically, Canaan is under martial law. It's not business as usual. It's, it's martial law. Whatever is there belongs to the Lord. It's a new Garden of Eden. God is going to cleanse the garden of the serpent that, that Adam failed to do in uh, the Garden of Eden. God himself is going to do this for Israel, but Israel is going to have to keep the snake out. Israel is going to have to not be tempted, not be lured by the gods of the nations. Otherwise, God says very clearly, the land will vomit them out, Leviticus 18.28. The land is holy now. The land will vomit them out. If the nations defiled the land, I'm sorry, if the nation of Israel defiles the land, then God will bring upon them exactly all of the curses that he has brought upon the idolatrous nations when he drove them out of Canaan. Deuteronomy 28, the first 68 verses. 29, verses 10 through 29, and chapter 30, verses 11 through 20. There is, there is some, uh, uh, <laughs> there are some passages on this. Eventually, they do follow Adam in their transgression, listening to the serpent, and Yahweh cuts them off from the temporal land. To put it simply, the Holy Spirit is not a plaything. His presence is as much judgment as comfort. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the one holy God. And even within these places, such as Eden and Canaan, there were concentric circles of increasing holiness and therefore danger. Uh, the tree of life uh, was at the heart of the paradise of God. That was very dangerous, especially after the fall. If Adam and Eve had been allowed to take from that tree and eat, they would have been confirmed everlastingly in death along with us. We would all be born into this world generation after generation with no hope of redemption, born for everlasting condemnation, confirmed in death. So to the innermost locus of the divine presence in Israel is the Holy of Holies, now with the Ark of the Covenant and its mercy seat. The very specifications that God uh, gave in the law created a replica of heaven on earth. The vertical was made horizontal with the most holy in the center as if that were the highest. The, the, the most central was the highest. And yet the horizontal aspect underscores also a holy history as the cloud kept moving the people toward the promise with a little tribe of Judah in the lead. The goal of the priest is to guard and keep the sanctuary, just as Adam, as priest, was to guard and keep the sanctuary. The priests of the temple were to guard and keep the temple so that nothing unclean entered its sacred precincts. To remain in the holy place, much less to eat the fruit of the tree of life, one has to be consecrated and accepted, confirmed in a state of righteousness, of justification. So God very generously 
uh, in Eden posted a cherubim at the entrance of the Holy of Holies to ensure the safety of Adam and Eve. He knew how curious, what a curious lot we are, and uh, very kindly and generously put soldiers, heavenly soldiers, uh, at the gate so that we wouldn't uh, sneak our way into the, uh, the, the Holy of Holies and take from the Tree of Life. So happily for us, God removed his throne from the earth. His immediate reign, going back to ruling through providence, through, through intermediate means, royal decree, but not immediately, re revealing his law, giving his law immediately, removes his sanctuary back to heaven and mercifully deconsecrates the land. It was for our good that it's no longer holy but common, that Eden now is deconsecrated. God's presence is no longer there. It's deconsecrated because if it were still holy, it would, it would consume the unholy human beings who failed to drive out the unholy serpent. Now, after the fall, the elect and reprobate both live east of Eden, intermingling with non-Christians, but forbidden to intermarry. And the basic outline of this appears again in Israel's history of exodus, conquest, and eventually exile. Like Adam, Israel broke my covenant, Hosea 6, 7. That's why I call the story of Israel the parenthesis, the, the story within a story, the play within a play, almost a parable of the larger story of Scripture. And so the Apostle Paul, as he interprets this history, reminds us, for I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and drank of the same spiritual drink, 1 Corinthians 10 one through three. No one was baptized into Christ directly through this typological exodus and cloud. It was a different covenant with different promises and different terms, but pointing to the same history, pointing to Christ in whom we will be baptized in the Spirit. The context of Paul's remark is the seriousness and holiness of the Lord's Supper, which the Corinthians had abused. Both the sacrament itself and the koinonia, the, the, the church communion, uh, that it generates over against the Corinthians' profanation of both uh, by chaotic uh, worship and sectarianism. While the typological baptism drowns Pharaoh's hosts, it saves the Israelites who pass through it safely on dry ground and all ate the same spiritual food, referring to the manna from heaven, and all drank from the same spiritual drink, the rock in the wilderness, which Paul says was Christ, typologically. And then he adds, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Not all made it into the typological promised land. In fact, Moses himself didn't make it into the promised land. Moses the mediator was barred. How much greater then is our loss if we fail to enter the everlasting rest? And of course that's the point that is made repeatedly through the epistle to the Hebrews. Hebrews 4, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, and Hebrews 12 uh, all recount this history indicating that there are three categories. There are in the new covenant those who are saved those who are lost, and then those who are in the covenant community as the children of Israel were of old, and yet do not receive the blessings. They don't embrace the reality, but have merely the signs. They have the preaching of the word, the rain falling on and off in Hebrews 6. They have the, the blessings of being reared in, in, in a, a covenantal nurture and yet they fall away, yet they, they fail to enter God's rest. They stop short of entering his rest, and they're therefore cut off. You can't be cut off unless you were in. 
to begin with. But he's not talking about salvation, as he says in chapter 6. I'm convinced of better things in your case, brothers and sisters, things that accompany salvation. So there's this tertium quid, something between being saved and lost. There's being a covenant member with greater responsibility even than the Old Testament saints and their covenant children because the promises are so much greater and the mediator is so much greater in this covenant. To be cut off from Israel was a, a terrible temporary uh, uh, loss, but to be cut off from Christ, from the visible covenant of grace and visible communion with his people is especially uh, horrifying. So I suggest it's this biblical theology that we should bring uh, to our thoughts about the spirit of holiness. It's clear that the Holy Spirit is not a harmless dove. Now, who would ever want this Holy Spirit thus described living in us? It sounds horribly dangerous. Well, it is, were it not for the fact that he is the spirit of Christ and that he comes to indwell us after Jesus Christ has already accomplished everything for our redemption. Already taken away our sins. Already provided the ground for our justification. It is Christ's circumcision death that cut him off completely, not just a part of him, but cut him off from the land of the living, excommunicated for you. And for me. Now the Holy Spirit can indwell us. The Holy Spirit cuts us away from not only that which is corrupt, but even that which is common. That's not bad. That's not sinful. That's not rebellious. But common. Not only hovering over us as he led the camp of Israel through the cloud, or even upon us, as with the prophets, and even Jesus. But now within us, the Spirit consecrates us permanently as his dwelling. Now, I was talking about how the Holy Spirit hid behind the curtain. But what happens when that curtain is torn from top to bottom? The, the veil is taken away. The Holy Spirit, you, you get almost get the sense with, with the flow of redemptive history, the Holy Spirit is just roaring to be poured out of that tent, to get out of that box, as it were, and to indwell all of his saints, to make them his temple, his great end-time sanctuary built without hands. This consecration that the Spirit brings is therefore both negative and positive. He's cutting us away from many things that we cherish, the things that, that we hold dear, he, 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 break, he pulls us away from, from that which is corrupt. This can be violent at times as he cuts us away from sin and death. And then it's a merciful act. That itself is a merciful act, but it's the gracious acceptance also, the adoption, justification, and engrafting of the formerly dead branches onto the living vine. Jesus uniquely could say that he sanctified, set apart, consecrated himself. Uh, we can't really, we can't say that. I know that there are conferences, at least in the United States, uh, where uh, people claim that they have truly sanctified themselves, but there's only one person who can say that he has truly and fully consecrated himself to the Lord, and that is Jesus. For their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may be truly sanctified. That was either one of the most arrogant statements in human history or Jesus is God. For their sakes, I sanctify myself. I make myself holy. Through his 33 years of active obedience, fulfilling all righteousness on our behalf, by sanctifying himself, we are truly sanctified. Not just forgiven, but justified and holy. Calvin notes, by these words, Jesus explains more clearly from what source that sanctification flows, which is completed in us by the doctrine of the gospel. 
It is because he consecrates himself to the Father that his holiness might come to us. For as the blessing on the first fruits is spread over the whole harvest, so the Spirit of God cleanses us by the holiness of Christ and makes us partakers of it. Nor is this done by imputation only. It pertains not only to justification. For in that respect, he is said to have been made to us righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1.30 but he is also said to have been made to us sanctification because he has, so to speak, presented to us to his Father in his own person that we may be renewed to true holiness by his Spirit. Besides, though the sanctification belongs to the whole life of Christ, yet the highest illustration of it was given in the sacrifice of his death. For then he showed himself to be the true high priest by consecrating the temple, the altar, all the vessels, and the people by the power of the Spirit. And so here we are standing now at the intersection of the Historia Salutis and the Ordo Salutis, the history of redemption and the order of salvation in the individual believer's life. In other words, the history of salvation and how you and I are saved, how we experience salvation how redemption is applied. Among others, Gerhardus Voss and Hermann Ritter Voss remind us of the dangers of reducing the new creation to individual believers. That's certainly true. There's a perennial danger, especially in the history of pietism and revivalism, for us to turn salvation into a personal, private experience that, that, that doesn't take into account the larger historical a, a cosmic sweep of what God is doing in history. But there's a danger of overreaction. We see this tendency in different ways in, uh, I, I would argue, Ernst Kosman, for example, various versions of the new perspective on Paul, where eschatology and ecclesiology are set over against getting saved. Moltmann is especially redolent to talk about the Ordo Salutis as if it represented an individualistic concern that took us away from the cosmic redemption that is the horizon of uh, New Testament understandings of salvation. What about this then? Well, let's, let's try to bring the Ordo and Salutis and the Historia Salutis together as we focus on baptism with the Spirit. When we come to baptism with the Spirit, it is true I believe that we should start with the broadest eschatological, redemptive historical horizon. We should start not with the individual, but with the, the canvas of history. The new creation isn't simply the sum total of regenerate believers. The new creation is not just me and you. The new creation is the result of the difference that Christ has made in history until Christ returns bodily to make the consummate difference in the world. In the meantime, we're being inserted by the Spirit into this new creation with Christ as the first fruits. Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 19, 28, Truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Palingenesia is the uh, word that is used here for new world, but uh, can be more accurately rendered, uh, as the NIV does, uh, the renewal of all things. Could even more precisely, I think, call it the regeneration of all things. There is both an individual collective import to this palingonesia, as implied in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Here's how the ESV reads. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. But I think the NIV is a little closer on this one. I don't usually say that. but uh, <laughs> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. See the difference? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
versus, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Literally, behold the new, uh, or behold has emerged the new. Both versions offer nearly identical renderings of the dependent clause. The old has passed away, behold the new has come, ESV. And the old has gone, the new is here, NIV. So basically the, de- uh, the same on the dependent clause. But the ESV rendering of the primary clause already prejudices a more individualistic and less eschatological view of the new creation. The new creation is, first of all, something that Christ has brought into the world as the first fruits. And then, as a result, something that we, as individuals, are swept into. So there is the new creation, and then uh, we uh, uh, become inserted by the Spirit into that uh, wonderfully cosmic work that he has accomplished. The new creation, indeed the new birth, is cosmic in scope. And individual the individual aspect. Paul says God has saved us, not God has saved it. <laughs> God has saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So real individuals are the, are, are the objects of the Spirit's renewal. The regeneration of all things began with Christ's bodily regeneration, resurrection, and will be consummated with the resurrection of our bodies and the restoration of the whole creation. Until then, each of us becomes inserted into this palingonesia by baptism into Christ's death and resurrection, as the passage from Titus 3.5 attests. And so this palingonesia, this renewal of all things, works from the, outside, uh, from the inside out. Uh, it's not, first of all, something that happens within us, that may have some effects in the world, but a transformation that comes to us from outside of ourselves comes to us from above, as Jesus told Nicodemus. Unless we are born from above, we cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And it causes a participation in the power of the new age, specifically by fellowship through the Spirit with the resurrected Christ as the last Adam. Seen in this light, the new birth, our new birth, the the individual believer's new birth, is no longer treated merely as something that happens within us because of what Christ accomplished so long ago. It is that, but it's more. It's a participation in that death and resurrection here and now by the baptism of the Spirit. We're not only raised spiritually, and one day bodily, because Christ died and was raised, his resurrection and ours actually belong to the same event, as Richard B. Gaffin has uh, argued helpfully. He's just the first fruits, but the first fruits and harvest belong to the same thing. His resurrection is the beginning of the resurrection of the dead. So I would suggest that that N.T. Wright, Jürgen Moltmann, and others are perfectly right to broaden the eschatological horizon from uh, uh, just focusing on the individual soul. But an implicit postmillennialism fails to do justice to the difference between the Spirit's work in these last days and his work when Christ returns on the last day of the old order. These last days are not yet the last day of this present evil age. And I think Paul points this up in 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. But for those whom the Spirit is drawing, he says, and notice the comparison between the Spirit's ex nihilo work uh, uh, in, uh, in creation and new creation. But for those whom the Spirit is drawing, Paul says, God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, 
let there be light, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ becomes the new son of this new creation. And it's, a, it's an ex nihilo event. Let there be light. Christ's ambassadors follow him now in his humiliation, suffering for the sake of the gospel, to reign with him in glory in the future, but not in the present. For now, Paul says, we are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. And we have to allow ourselves to, to think, that's a creepy thought. <laughs> Until we surrender to the sweetness of it, knowing it's Jesus. We are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be also manifested in our bodies. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You see what he's saying? He's not saying that, that our, our, our bodily existence doesn't matter. He's not saying the cosmos doesn't matter. He's not saying that it's the, the eschatological horizon of the palingonesia is reduced to the individual soul and going to heaven when we die and so on and so forth. He's not saying any of that, but he is saying for now the palingonesia is taking the form of regeneration, the deaf hearing, the blind seeing, the poor having the gospel preached to them. And then when Jesus returns, our bodies will share in the regal dignity uh, of glorification. As with the old creation, even more so with the new, the fiat word from heaven alone can bring it into being. Let there be, and there was. It's a lot harder, uh, as it were, speaking in human terms, it's a lot harder for God to regenerate than it was for him to create in the first place. Someone asked Martin Luther, uh, are you saying we don't contribute anything to our salvation? And he said, oh, I'm sorry if I gave you that impression. No, I don't mean that at all. No, we contribute a lot, sin and resistance. <laughs> and you know, that's, that's what we are contributing. It's not just that there isn't anything, there is, there is sin and resistance and rebellion. What he speaks into existence is life and joy and peace where there's only war and rebellion and hostility and hatred of everything he is and represents. Consequently, the spirit's descent brings disturbance and conflict. Into, it brings it into this present evil age and into our own hearts. On one hand, he brings us assurance that is so comforting, but the same presence that brings us assurance starts a war. The war between the flesh and the spirit. The spirit gives us new birth, delivers us, as it were, at this precarious and busy intersection between the two ages. This passing evil age, which is dying, that's covered on the news every night. And the age to come that is breaking in on this present evil age, it was it's, it's at that busy intersection, that precarious intersection, that you and I were born into the new creation. And the Holy Spirit not only gives us birth there, he keeps us there. He assures us there. But he never lets us squirm away from that intersection until glory. It's the intersection of the already and the not yet. Baptism with a spirit then, is union with Christ. My second point under this uh, theme of baptism with the spirit. Baptism with the spirit is union with Christ. The spirit unites Christ to our humanity. That's amazing in itself. The spirit unites the second person of the Holy Trinity to our humanity forever. Forever, the second person of the Holy Trinity is, is one of us. And then, after glorifying that humanity, unites us to Christ as our federal head. 
Romans 5. And then in Romans 6, Paul uh, answers the famous question, uh, shall we then sin that grace may abound? Uh, There are all sorts of answers to this. One, of course, is the antinomian answer. Uh, Sure, God likes to forgive. I like to sin. It's a perfect relationship. Uh, then there's the, 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 the uh, uh, legalistic response. Well, if you do, then you'll lose your salvation or at least jewels in your crown or something big and important. You'll lose. <laughs> For Paul, it's to give more gospel. Hey, wait, 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 wait. You didn't understand the whole scope of the gospel. It's not just justification. He frees us not only from the curse and judgment of our sin, but from the dominion and cruel, tyrannical rule of sin. All who are united to Christ in his death for forgiveness, Paul says, are united to him in his resurrection for new creation life. You don't have some people in one category and other people in another category. You're either in Christ or not in Christ, but you can't choose which part of Christ you're going to identify with. I think one of the tragedies of contemporary debates is the separation of baptism or as I prefer, baptism with the Spirit. And also the separation of both uh, uh, from baptism itself, which I'll talk about uh, tomorrow. I want to focus here on the first problem. While there is, I I believe, a distinction without separation between the sacrament of baptism and the new birth, there's a clear distinction between the sacrament and the reality. I'm not aware of a single passage that suggests even a distinction between baptism into Christ and spirit baptism. We are only in the spirit because we are in Christ. If we are said to be in the Spirit, it is only shorthand for being in Christ. Because, as we've seen, to be in Christ is to have the Spirit. To have the Spirit is to be in Christ. Christ's ministry and the Spirit's ministry are so interchangeable because their mission is the same in this time between the times, even though they do what they do differently. In fact, it's better to say we're baptized into Christ by the Spirit. We're not, properly speaking, baptized in the Spirit. We're baptized with the Spirit into Christ. We do not have a single blessing in the Holy Spirit. We don't have some blessings in Christ and then other blessings in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the mediator. The Holy Spirit cannot be the mediator because that's not who he is. The Holy Spirit is the one who unites us to the mediator. All of our blessings are found in Christ. The Holy Spirit unites us to Christ and therefore to all of his benefits. Even if we seek anointing in the Spirit, we will only find it in Christ. We go to Christ for the Holy Spirit. We do not go to the Holy Spirit for the Holy Spirit. We go to Christ for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's whole job description is to focus our eyes, to rivet us, to fix us on Christ, the pioneer uh, of our salvation. There is one baptism Ephesians 4, 5, that is administered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit, Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission. And so to see the Spirit as a distinct source of heavenly blessing is to make him another mediator alongside Christ. Everything comes from the Father in the Son by the Spirit. The new creation is neither an improvement of the old creation nor its destruction. Rather, the Son has entered into creation as the first fruits of the new order, and the Spirit is now uniting the children of disobedience to the last Adam. So Paul can say that like Jesus himself in his pattern of death and resurrection, our bodies are sown in dishonor because of sin, yet raised in glory 
in Christ Jesus. Thus, it is written, the first man became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, 1 Corinthians 15.43. So what do we receive with the Spirit's baptism? Christ, with all of his benefits, and along with Christ and all of his benefits, the Holy Spirit as the Arabon, the deposit on our redemption. This is the amazing thing about it. They have to keep giving each other. The Spirit gives Christ. Christ gives the Spirit. Uh, the, the incredible mutuality, the, 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 the uh, as it were, interdependence of these persons in their love for each other and their love for us uh, is, is deeply moving. First, the Spirit unites us here and now to Christ by working within us to raise us from spiritual death. And in this Trinitarian way of thinking, effectual calling is, is not coercive. It's not the operation uh, of an external force on, a, on, a, uh, 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 on an object, like a hammer on a nail. The Holy Spirit is the one who is working within us to win our consent, to bring us effectually, draw us effectually to that word that has been spoken by the Father in the Son. And that's why nothing that the Father speaks ever returns to him without accomplishing every purpose for which he sent it. Isaiah 55, 11. When God says, let there be light, whether in the first creation or the new creation, it is so. There is generation in the first creation and regeneration in the second. But he also commands, let the earth bring forth. The new birth in which we're passive recipients yields to conversion in which we are now active for the first time. In regeneration, we're, we're passive. Let there be light is not the result of us saying, okay, I've decided to have the light. In, in, in regeneration, we're passive. Uh, it's ex nihilo. Let there be life where there's only death. Let there be light where there is only darkness. But then there's conversion. Conversion consists of repentance and faith, turning away, turning toward. That's not God doing that for us. But we can only do it because of regeneration. We can only do it because he gives us repentance and faith as gifts. Nevertheless, we are active now because we have been activated by his renewing grace. In fact, that's uh, how you find actual instances of conversion uh, in the New Testament. Think of the case of Lydia, Acts 16, 14. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. The Lord opened her heart, she, but she listened. The Lord didn't open her heart because she listened. The Lord opened her heart, and as a result, she listened. But it, it's... It, it changes this view of the Holy Spirit at work within us to yield assent and trust in what the external word proclaims from the Father in the Son it is, is a very different way of talking about effectual calling than imagining uh, that it is simply the, the unmediated, direct lightning bolt uh, that comes even apart from the gospel. In every instance in the New Testament, where the new birth is given a means, an instrument, uh, it is the preaching of the gospel. God's word is effective because it comes from the Father, because it proclaims the Son, and because it is made complete in us, winning our consent by the Holy Spirit. And so union with Christ is the motif that encompasses all of the gifts that we receive in salvation. We find even our anointing with the Spirit by being united with Christ. And yet, Calvin is exactly right when he says, no particle of grace from God in Christ ever comes to us, no particle of it, except through the Holy Spirit. No particle comes to us except in Christ, but no particle of it comes to us 
uh, apart from the, the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit. So the bottom line, we don't look to Christ for one level of salvation and to the Spirit for another. We get on the plane with Jesus and we move into first class with the Holy Spirit. We look to Christ who gives himself and the Holy Spirit with all of his gifts. We may be on different stages, on different days. In the transformation, the let there be, and there was part of that. But we all share in one Lord, one spirit, one baptism. Against both Rome and the Anabaptists, Calvin emphasizes with Paul that we do not find Christ by ascending into heaven or by descending into our hearts, but by the work of the Holy Spirit through his word. We are one with the Son of God, he says, not because he conveys his substance to us, but because by the power of his spirit, he imparts to us his life and all the blessings which he has received from the Father. Since we are clothed with the righteousness of the Son in justification, he adds, we are reconciled to God and renewed by the power of the Spirit to holiness. Because of the judicial aspect of the Spirit's work, in uniting us to Christ, justification. Because of that, since that has happened, now Christ can be for us also our sanctification, our gradual growth in holiness. Let there be, and there was, along with the progressive sanctification of let the earth bring forth, and the earth brought forth. Truly, you bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. You're not passive in that as you are in your new birth. You're active, and that activity itself is no less due to the Holy Spirit's grace than the ex nihilo miracle of regeneration. And so we don't descend into ourselves in sanctification any more than we do in justification. We look outside of us to Christ, and that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit doesn't make us introverts. The Holy Spirit doesn't take our eyes off of Christ and put our eyes on his work within us, his graces within, but drives us out of ourselves to focus our eyes on Christ and his finished work for us. Declared holy, let this sinner be justified. Also declared alive, let this dead person now be alive, but then also let the earth bring forth. Bring forth, therefore, the fruit of righteousness and holiness. All that is found in Christ is holy because it is in Christ. Christ is the holy land. Christ is consecrated. He has been cut off for us, for our excommunication was laid upon him. And he has been raised in glory so that now everything that lives in that land lives off of him. Every branch that is connected to this vine bears fruit and bears fruit in fact that will last and then in the apocalypse everything that is unclean the serpent that defiles and tempts is cast out of the cosmic temple forever and that's when there will be no distinction between heaven and earth finally once and for all God himself having cast the serpent out of the garden will cleanse it, and everything within its holy precincts will be holy to the Lord. The pots, the pans, the dishes, the sheep, the goldfish, whatever is in there, whatever is in there in the new creation will be holy to the Lord. And so Christ is the source of all blessings. Now, advocates of a separate baptism of the Spirit appeal to the examples in Acts. In Acts 8, some Samaritans who had received the word of the Lord have been baptized, we read, in the name of the Lord Jesus and received the Spirit only when the apostles arrived to pray and lay hands on them. This is Acts 8, 14 through 17. Something similar happened in, Ephes uh, in Ephesus, reported in Acts 19. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Paul asked a group of believers and they said, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. 
Sounds like some of us. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> just just uh, uh, speaking of my own context back home. <laughs> and he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Much of the distinction between the, uh, the first blessing and the second <laughs> blessing is based on these two examples in Acts. This is an instance of the limits of inductive Bible study. The meaning is obvious and non-controversial to both sides in the debate. The decisive question is more deductive, that is, interpreting particular passages in the light of other relevant passages. So Pentecostals come to Acts 8 and 19 presupposing that they are paradigmatic for today and non-Pentecostals come to the same passages presupposing that they are unique episodes in the first generation of believers. For example, John Stott says, because this Samaritan incident was so clearly abnormal, it is difficult to see how most Pentecostals and some charismatic Christians can regard it as constituting a norm for spiritual experience today. Well, for exegetical reasons, I hope to have demonstrated uh, in part at least, it shouldn't surprise anyone that I agree with Stott. The book of Acts is less a bl blueprint than it is the announcement of the acts of Christ by his spirit through the apostles of whom there are no living successors. There's no reason to assume that all the marvelous signs of the spirits outpouring in the apostolic era are normative for today and that's especially true when we do have a clear norm for all Christians spelled out clearly in the epistles, which teach that baptism into Christ is the Spirit's baptism, and that all those who are in Christ share in his anointing. The Samaritans in Acts 8 have been dazzled by Simon the magician's tricks, but when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, verse 12. In fact, even Simon believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. But of course, Simon uh, uh, eventually fell away. That's for another story. The point here is, rejoicing at the news of the gospel's success in Samaria, the apostles sent Peter and John, quote, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Some connection here between being baptized in the name of Jesus and the Holy Spirit not being given. It's a step beyond John's baptism, but it's still not the triune formula that Jesus mandated in his great commission. Pentecost is now being brought to the next ring from Jerusalem and Judea to Samaria. Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, we read in verse 25, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans along the way. If Samaria is the one ring outside of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, Ephesus belongs to the uttermost parts of the earth. So it's not surprising that they... The, the Ephesians were even more deficient in their knowledge than the Samaritans. The Ephesians in Acts 19 are identified as disciples, verse 1. Paul asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? This isn't a normative question for us to ask believers today, but a reasonable question for an apostle to ask Samaritan disciples, uh, 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 Ephesian disciples who had not yet known about, much less received the Holy Spirit and had uh, received only John's baptism. And they said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And notice the logic in Paul's response this time. Into what then were you baptized? Assuming that Jesus is the author of the triune formula of the Great Commission, 
and that this formula was already standard for legitimate baptism in Paul's day, I would insert name into Paul's question. Into what name then were you baptized? And I think that interpretation supported by their answer. Into John's baptism, which of course lacked a Trinitarian formula. Now it all makes sense, Paul must have been thinking. John's baptism was different from the one that Christ inaugurated. In fact, Paul explains to them, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, Jesus. So Paul laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. It's a little Pentecost. It's going, the gospel, what happened in the upper room for Jerusalem and Judea is now happening to Samaria. Again, the distinction between the foundation laying era, era of the apostles and the building program that we are in today. In any cases, brothers and sisters, even if these instances are normative, here's how they would have to be normative uh, for us. They would, they would be only normative in relation to a very specific set of circumstances. With disciples who profess faith in Christ but are unaware of the Holy Spirit and have been baptized by John the Baptist <laughs> or in the name of Jesus apart from the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. If they meet all of those criteria, then this is normative for today. But if anything, these passages press us to see not only a closer relationship between Christ and the Spirit, but between baptism with water and baptism into Christ without in any way identifying water baptism with, the, uh, with uh, regeneration. So I, again, appreciate Stott's argument that while spirit baptism is enjoyed by all who are united to Christ through faith, there are degrees of filling. There is not one case of believers being called to be baptized with the Spirit. But there are cases uh, of imperatives to be filled, to be led by the Spirit. In fact, I think being filled by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, are two ways uh, to say the same thing. And then this great work of the Spirit is not only a baptism and a filling, but also a sealing, as in Ephesians 1, 13, and 14. Once again, there's a legal aspect, a seal, testifying, assuring us uh, of our adoption by God the Father. This guarantee or sealing is objective. You may not feel saved. You may not. He indwells you at the low points and as the high points, without any diminishing of his sealing capacity. He is the seal. He is an objective seal of our salvation, the down payment on our final redemption. And all of it, as Paul tells us in Ephesians, is to the praise of his glory. The ultimate aim of this whole plan of salvation is that from election in Ephesians 1.4, to our glorification for which we hope. It's all God's everlasting glory. To the praise of his glory, is that phrase, or to the praise of his glorious grace, appears again in verse 6 in connection with our, uh, uh, our, our calling and our trusting in Christ, verse 12, and now here again, verses 13 and 14, in connection with our final glorification. It's all of God, all of grace, so that God can receive all of the glory. And that's the wonderful good news that we see poured out to us, all of the great gifts that he's poured out to us in his ascension that we heard about, uh, read as Ed was reading, or Peter was reading from Ephesians 4. He goes to heaven, ascends to heaven, the right hand of the Father. He sends the Spirit. And what does the Spirit do? He passes out all the gifts. We have a way of celebrating birthdays in Southern California uh, because of the Mexican-American influence uh, with pinatas. So uh, 
You know, our kids love pinatas for birthdays. Can't have a birthday without a pinata. You, you know what a pinata is? Okay. So uh, I, I can't get that, that picture out of my mind when I think about Ephesians 4. Christ goes to the right hand of the Father, and he... Yeah, I know. That's probably, that's probably what he's doing right now. Uh, uh, Christ goes to the right hand of the Father, and when he lands in that seat, the pinata bursts. And all the candy goes everywhere. And the Holy Spirit is just passing it out. And all these gifts are for each other. That is, I've run out of time, so I can't do it now, but I've run out of, uh, uh, that, that, is, that is, out of that wonderful news, the announcement that he has conquered and from conquering has now spent, sent his Holy Spirit to allot Canaan to the tribes. Out of all of that wonderful news, he calls us now to bear the fruit of the Spirit toward each other. How can we not be brothers and sisters dwelling in unity and joy and peace and patience and long-suffering with each other, given all this that Christ has accomplished for us as the victor victorious conqueror who now divides the spoils and what spoils there are and showers his people, even enemies now, with his precious gifts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being the generous and liberal God who loves to give more than to receive. The one who is not receiving gifts but is giving gifts through the ascension of the Lord Jesus and the sending of the Holy Spirit. Father, help us to keep up with the Spirit as he's passing out these gifts. Help us to be his elves passing around these gifts so that every day becomes another Christmas. Every day we have a chance to love and serve our neighbors as we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Hear us, for we pray in his name. Amen. All right, we're now going to move into a question time, and uh, we're going to begin after Professor Horton has had a little drink, uh, with him answering some questions from the question box. So I'm just going to invite Michael to, to take over and answer those questions. All righty. Yeah, I wanted to, before we moved on to the questions of today, not just roll over the questions you've been putting in the box. Uh, can you comment on the charge that those from a Reformed tradition limit the spirit because they don't really believe in the miracles uh, and have been influenced more by uh, modern Enlightenment traditions. Yes, I've heard this, uh, this criticism, and I certainly think it's true of Protestant liberalism, but I don't think it, it, it sticks at all. For, uh, uh, for Reformed Christians who hold to, even those who hold to, to a very strict cessationist perspective, that is that the sign gifts have ceased, uh, it's not because of a wariness of the miraculous. If I think of someone like B.B. Warfield, uh, the Lion of Princeton, wrote a, wrote a book arguing that uh, the, the, the era of the sign gifts, gifts has ended, was one of the, the greatest defenders of the supernatural character of the Bible and uh, the miracles of Jesus and his identity as, as the God-man. Uh, went right up against en Enlightenment <laughs> notions. Uh, and uh, furthermore, the, the argument that I've been making here, which is not, I would say, strict cessationist, it's not uh, uh, that these things can't happen or don't ever happen, um, especially visions, I think, on the mission field with Muslims. Uh, you know, there, it's not that I don't think any things happen out of the ordinary. Uh, those who have made the argument, though, that there, are no, no, there is no office of apostles still today are not guided by the Enlightenment. We're talking about church fathers, Syrian, Egyptian, Northern African church fathers, and uh, uh, Anselm, Augustine, uh, the Reformers. They're hardly uh, indebted to the, the Enlightenment. Um, 
for those views. Now, uh, what do you make of uh, Paul's argument, the private use of tongues in 1 Corinthians 14? This is a great question, and uh, I wasn't able to get to it. Uh, so let me just uh, very quickly, uh, so I'll be quick about it, mention uh, the passage. Okay, so Paul abrades the Corinthians for severing the gift of tongues from uh, intelligent interpretation and proclamation of the gospel. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. In the law it is written, be people of strange, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even when they will not listen to me, says the Lord. These tongues are a sign, Paul says, not for believers but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers but for believers. 1 Corinthians 14, 20 to 23. Well, by invoking Isaiah 28, 11, and 12, Paul is, is uh, identifying tongues as a sign of temporary judgment on the Jews. In Romans 11, he argues that a partial hardening has happened in order to make the Jews jealous by God working with the Gentiles. And if their fullness... Uh, sorry, if their failure, Paul says in, in Romans 11, 11, if, if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? For now, I think, what Paul's saying is tongues serve as a, a judgment against the Jews who are having to listen to the gospel in foreign tongues, foreign languages, as prophesied by Isaiah. They should have embraced the gospel immediately, first, but now they're hearing Gentile dogs <laughs> preaching their gospel they should have embraced. And Paul adds that this is exactly why prophecy, preaching, rather than speaking in foreign tongues, should be used in public worship. Otherwise, he says, if outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're out of your minds? But when they hear intelligible preaching and teaching, They'll be convinced of that word, he says. So, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. When there are intelligible words of prophecy uh, uh, proclaimed and, and taught. Um, from the Spirit's work in creation, how do we distinguish the work of the Spirit in creation, the work of the Son? Remember, everything is from the Father. It is, it's a great rule and very simple. From the Father, in the Son, by the Spirit. The first way to distinguish the work in creation is to remember that everything comes from the Father, in the Son, by the Spirit. God's external works are analogous to the, uh, to, to the uh, inter internal processions. Uh, the Son coming from the Father uh, and the Spirit coming from the Father and the Son. The Son is the mediator. The Spirit is the one who, who uh, puts it all together. Um, is it right to say that Jesus is a new creation, ex nihilo, by the Spirit at his conception, as well as an old creation, so that he's like us in every way but without sin? If so, how should we think of his human nature, and what place does his resurrection take in him becoming a new creation? Um, well, first, this is what it means to be firstborn from the dead, the firstborn of creation. Arians, of course, interpreted this as the first created being because they had no eschatology. <laughs> this is, you know, the, the, his title, firstborn from the dead, or firstborn over all creation, uh, isn't about his eternal deity. It's precisely about his assuming our humanity. And, and so, ironically, if we don't recognize this kind of adoptionism, today I have begotten you, uh, if we don't uh, acknowledge that kind of adoption of Jesus as the last Adam fulfilling his role, we can interpret those verses in a, an adoptionistic, capital A, adoptionistic way that says, well, therefore, these verses are about his, his eternal deity. Uh, declared to be the Son of God, Paul says, uh, um, according to the Holy Spirit, by his resurrection from the dead, there again, uh, not referring to, to his eternal deity changing, but rather to his status 
now as the glorified last Adam. Now, plug them in. (laughs) This is what you want to plug them into because this is what they'll be like. Only when he was glorified was the Spirit sent because only then did we have our human federal head uh, that we could be plugged into for everlasting life. Only then was he at the status uh, uh, where he could be of saving, uh, saving rather than condemning source for us. Thanks, Michael. So we will now open up to questions that you might have from today's lecture. So the microphones will come around. There's one down the front here. And put your hands up and the people with microphones. And I'll just point to you and Michael can just answer. <laughs> All right, over here first. Thank you again, um, Professor. Um, If I've understood you correctly, it sounds like um, you're saying the indwelling of the Spirit is a necessary precursor of our participation in the new creation um, and and obviously heaven. Um, And so if that's right, I wonder if you could reflect on how does this function for the Old Testament saints um, who did not live to see the indwelling of the Spirit? Yes, good question. Um, I, I do not, uh, I, at, the, at present, I'm, I'm asked, anybody, any of you, there are people here who, could, who can uh, really help me on this, but all that I have been able to see uh, in, the, in the months now that I've been working on this in preparation for these lectures, I can't come to any other conclusion thus far, at least, than that Old Testament saints were not permanently indwelled by the Holy Spirit. It's one of the great announcement of the prophets that this will happen. Uh, Jesus, Jesus even tells the disciples, right now he is with you, but then he will be in you. And I think that there's just a, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the spirit had not yet been poured out, uh, John 7, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. You just have, I think, too many passages that uh, mark this as a watershed the prophets promised. Not only that he's poured out on more people than he was in the Old Testament, but that even when he came on these select people in the Old Testament, he came and withdrew. He could be taken away. He, uh, he came on them for a certain mission and then went away. Not even in judgment, but just they stopped prophesying or what have you. In this case, uh, the Holy Spirit a deposit he has given him as a deposit that sounds like it's a qualitatively new gift of the new creation it is a new creation it there's continuity grows out of the old but the old doesn't have the power to bring about the realities that are given in the new creation which is why paul even goes so far as to to contrast the ministry of condemnation moses covenant the old covenant with the ministry of the Spirit and life, New Covenant. I think that we have to take those, those contrasts as seriously as we take the continuities. Am I on? Oh, hello. Hi. Um, so this is kind of following on from yesterday because I was waiting to hear what you said today. Um, but uh, yesterday, you, uh, one of your conclusions was, so we don't need an office of prophet anymore, or uh, these miraculous gifts um, aren't necessary, um, prophecy or tongues or healings. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that you, you don't mean that they're, they absolutely don't happen anymore, not totally cessationist. And if that's the case, um, can you explain the benefit of concluding um, this, like an explanation of the purpose uh, with mm, your concluding talking about these kind of miraculous gifts in negative terms, that is, we don't need them, rather than in term, like in positive terms of their use today. Um, and maybe a, another way of saying that is, so should, even if we don't require these gifts, should we desire them? Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, first of all, really quickly, just to make, indwelling, not indwelling doesn't mean not regenerate. I think we have to be ready to not under, to, 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 to see regeneration as continuity, but there are discontinuities about the experience of the Holy Spirit 
uh, uh, in that complex. So uh, uh, now I'll switch over to, to your question. Um, I, yeah, I don't. I, I, I shouldn't use the terminology that we don't need them. I don't decide whether we need them or not. Uh, I, I, uh, I, sometimes uh, they're needed, sometimes they're not. But God determines that. The question really is, is uh, not whether we need them, but where, what has God, first of all, intended by them? And so that's why I say we've got to go back to the question, what are these sign gifts, before we even talk about whether they're still for today. Because I think that what passes for sign gifts today largely don't fit the pattern of acts, uh, that they aren't even of the same nature as the, the gifts of the book of Acts. Um, the miracles were, were signs that pointed to the reality they signified. It's striking to me that Jesus never used signs as a way of drawing attention to his divinity. Rather, what he did was use the signs to, uh, to uh, announce who he is as the God-man. In other words, he's not doing it as a, as a sort of... Uh, to overpower people, he knows that they aren't going to believe, even if one were to raise, uh, be, be raised from the dead. For this, the Holy Spirit must come, and all of the things that we've been talking about, a wicked generation looks for signs. But it's of great redemptive historical significance, as well as for the people who, who saw, that they understand who he is, not just that he is God, but as God, what is he doing? He is raising the dead. He is uh, opening the eyes of the blind. Uh, he is fulfilling Isaiah 61 as the one who opens the ears of the deaf and so forth. The poor have the gospel preached to them. He's doing all of these things to announce that he is the one of whom the prophets spoke, both God and man, but mainly each sign points to an aspect of his identity. Uh, as the Messiah. So I think he did that. I think that that is, we point people to the scriptures. Uh, one classic uh, example for me it, uh, that is distinguished from prophecy is visions. That's why I'll just, I, I mentioned that in passing. Um, Cornelius receives a vision to go talk to Peter. It's remarkable that even in the apostolic era, it is still by the preaching of the word, specifically the gospel, that people are converted. And so surely God could have told Cornelius the gospel and saved him a trip. But he sent Cornelius to Peter and told Peter, meet him at you know uh, 11 Main Street to preach the gospel to him. And it's when he preached the gospel to him uh, that uh, he believed and was filled with the Spirit and so forth. So uh, that's what we're seeing in the, I I uh, all over the world today with Muslims not connected to each other, uh, having visions to go talk to so-and-so secretly underground, th this person. Uh, that's, that's the sort of thing. It doesn't contribute to revelation at all. God is simply telling them supernaturally where to go to hear the gospel uh, that they that they couldn't otherwise discover because of their circumstances. I don't doubt for a moment uh, that th that those things happen. Um, I do I do doubt though that there are people who have today a ministry of signs and wonders or a ministry of prophecy because those ministries are not informal. Those ministries are offices in the New Testament, and it's those offices that I believe are moribund in the post-apostolic era. If the offices are no longer around, then we don't, at least we can say we don't expect the jobs that those officers used to do to be around. Uh, but, you know, again, putting absolutely no limits on what the Lord uh, can do. It's a question of what we can expect. It's like the question, does God save anybody outside the church? Yeah. 
I mean, I, I you know, the, uh, but I don't know. God, all we have is what God has told us about believing the gospel and being saved, and that's why the gospel goes out to the nations. Whatever God does secretly is secret. <laughs> And uh, I think that's true, too, with the, the miracles. Another question next door. What are the implications of taking the Acts experience of the Spirit as non-normative for parts of the epistles that speak into a church that had that experience? For example, Ephesians 1, which you referred to, written to the Ephesian church with their experience of the Spirit. It seems that they would have had a different understanding of when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Can you elaborate? I'm not sure I understand the, why that would be. They would have a different understanding. What would that understanding be? Uh, they had an experience of the Spirit to look back to that we looked at in Acts mm -hmm. uh, and was called non-normative. Uh, how do we get away from that kind of reading of Ephesians to say, oh, for us, uh, whether we feel the Spirit or not, we are told that we are marked with him. Okay, I guess I wouldn't read so much into Ephesians 1.13 uh, to, 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 to say that they were, uh, the sealing with the Spirit was somehow uh, defined already in Acts. Uh, I think that what Paul's talking about there are the objective gifts that we have in union with Christ. Election is not an experience that varies. It's something that uh, is a decision that God has made from all of eternity. Redemption is something that happened outside of us 2,000 years ago. And the sealing uh, with the Spirit is something that the Spirit does objectively uh, with us and in us. And uh, I agree with the reformers at this point that this sealing is visibly represented, represented in water baptism. And so uh, this is why, this is why uh, I think good pastoral counsel in the past has been uh, look to the promise that God has made to you in your baptism. And this is the, this is the confidence, the objective confidence that we have uh, through faith. Now, if we, if we don't believe the promises, then that baptism, uh, uh, you know, we're not receiving the reality that it promises. And we're judged. We're cut off. Um, but if we believe the promises conveyed to us in baptism, baptism is a sign and seal of God's uh, covenant mercy. Is that? There's a question up the back. Yeah. Hi, thanks for that. Um, I think earlier you mentioned, uh, if I heard you correctly, that uh, whatever is in the new creation will be holy to the Lord, I think you mentioned. Um, just wondering if you could comment on this in relation to sort of hell um, in the new creation and whether it's right to think of that as kind of holy and sort of consecrated mm. to the Lord, if you've got some comments on that. Yeah, um, very, very tough. Um, it's not easy to, to uh, for us to talk about. One day it will because we'll actually be holy as God is holy, and we'll, we'll understand it all. But uh, yeah, as far as I can tell um, from, from Scripture, that's exactly what hell is, holy, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not a place where people are separated from God forever. I think it's one of the, one of the, the un most unhelpful things we say to people in evangelism. Uh, you know, you're going to spend eternity apart from God. Well, they're they're pretty happy with doing it now. Uh, if there is an eternity, I would on you know on balance prefer to have it without God. My life is without God. Um, no, that that's that's not hell. We don't find that in in uh, in the scriptures. What we find is that it's where God is present eternally in justice and holiness, and wrath. Um, and so uh, the only reason that, that heaven is heaven for us is Jesus. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit giving us the faith to trust in him. 
to be united to him. Um, everything, the whole cosmos is claimed, is, is under martial law as holy to the Lord. But hell is that, uh, that um, region where holy to the Lord means destruction rather than deliverance. Hi, Michael. Hi. How are you going? Actually, don't answer. That's why? What? What, what did you say? Like. Sorry, I missed it. It was funny, and I want to hear anything funny. I asked you how you were going. Uh, <laughs> um, I've really appreciated you speaking about the new age of the Spirit and how the Spirit is indwelling in believers in a, a new way, in a permanent way. That's been really great, and I, f I feel like that's quite consistent with something like John 10, 28, where Jesus is talking about um, believers never being snatched away. But I, f I still feel confused about the rest of Scripture or parts of Scripture that talk about, I think, the Spirit leaving a person. Um, so we, in Colossians one uh, twenty three, Paul seems to suggest that people can fall away. They might, if they don't continue in faith, then they, they won't be saved. So there's that possibility of, I guess, not having the Spirit. You see in 2 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy, Hymenaeus, and Alexander and Philetus, they were believers and they swerved from the truth. So mm -hmm. th they also seem to have been saved at one point and not be. And then in, in Hebrews 3 and 4 and 6, looks like that's happening there as well, but particularly the Spirit. So people have tasted the Spirit yep. and now... They aren't. So, can you speak to that? Sure, sure. I'll try to be as, as brief as I, I can. Um, maybe even briefer. Uh, first of all, Colossians. If indeed, uh, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Uh, they're hearers of the word. They have heard, they, they have heard and they have embraced it, at least uh, in, in terms of assent. Um, uh, but not all, but, but uh, many who have embraced it in terms of assent have also trusted in the reality proclaimed in the gospel, namely Jesus Christ. I think Hebrews is ex uh, exactly the same. Uh, Hebrews 6, these people have been, once been enlightened, uh, which uh, I... I uh, take to be uh, a reference to baptism. Enlightened was early church speak for baptism. Uh, have tasted of the heavenly gift. Wonder what that is. The Lord's Supper. Have tasted of the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. But then they fall away. They go back, in this case, they, I believe, they, in the context, they go back to Judaism. People who have now embraced the faith or have even now grown up as a generation in the faith. Land that has drunk the water often. That's how he describes these people uh, who were baptized, tasted, and so forth. Look, these are really odd descriptions, right? They've tasted, tasted, tasted. They've sensed. They've been even in a certain sense made partakers of the Holy Spirit, but they clearly fall away. Uh, they were the land where the rain falls often, but it doesn't soak into the soil. And so clearly they're the tares sown among, uh, sown among the wheat, but they're in the same field. They're in the, they're in the covenant, but not of the covenant, as it were. How do we know? Because he says, however, Brothers and sisters, we're convinced of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. So on one hand, it seems to me, those who believe it's merely hypothetical, uh, it doesn't really happen, have trouble explaining that the writer seems to think that it does. And it's a real warning. The, uh, those who, take, uh, who, who believe that we can fall away and lose our salvation, I think have problems with him saying, but we're not talking about what happens in your case, things that accompany salvation. So then what are we talking about? A third category of people who've been baptized, receive communion regularly, hear God's word regularly, and through those means, in some sense, as, as Calvin calls it, the general experience of the Holy Spirit in the, in the church, 
uh, are made partakers of the Holy Spirit, not baptized, but made partakers. Did you hear that language? Partakers, taste. None of this is consume. They don't feed on the reality. They don't receive. They don't embrace. But they taste and have some participation in sort of, in a general way. Um, something short of regeneration. Something short of being part of the new creation itself. But they were part of the visible covenant community where the spirit is visibly active in the whole community through the means of grace. People really can taste the powers of the age to come. The, the reprobate really can taste the powers of the age to come. And that's why they are, that's why they are more culpable as Esau was for selling their birthright. So that's how I would interpret those uh, passages. They really fall away, but they're not re uh, elect, they're not regenerate. Um, what they fall away from is the covenant, which is why they're excommunicated eventually if they, if they walk out on faith. Uh, and so he's just, he, he's encouraging in all of these passages, all of these real warning passages, he's telling people, don't just be hearers uh, who assent to the historical truths of the gospel, but put your faith in Jesus Christ. And, and uh, still good warnings for us today. Thanks. This is going to have to be the last one. So if you have other questions, write them down and put them in the box, but we'll have the last last question. Um, you're going to have to forgive me because this is a, a sort of a vague question that I'm sort of formulating as I go, as we say around here, the vibe. Um, and, and it picks up on your, your throwaway line about um, we don't talk about the Holy Spirit in our parts. Uh, sort of um, publicity problem maybe in what we call evangelical circles and maybe you'd call more reformed circles that we're happy to teach about the Holy Spirit and we're happy to teach. Or there's not a lot of, you know, certainly no miracles in these parts. Um, and, you know, singing, well, we do that reluctantly. And therefore, among our congregation members, I w I w I've certainly witnessed, you know, a, a dissatisfaction in our church services and in, in our church life generally, uh, to the point that some would go away to other churches um, and the sort of desire for a third way church where we have the teaching of an evangelical church with the activity of a charismatic church or that sort of thing. Um, you're nodding, so I'm guessing this kind of makes sense. Can you comment on that, maybe on what the problem is and, and what we should be doing in our teaching and church activities to address what I think is a, a problem in our churches? Uh, I feel your pain. I, this is this is something that uh, I think is a real issue in our in reform circles, conservative reform circles in the states. Uh, and it's with that in mind, out of my own context, that I uh, have have written my talk for tomorrow. I'm really not just doing an advertisement uh, to try to get you back for tomorrow. But the whole thing is really how. The ordinary ministry is the, is the signs and wonders movement, and uh, that uh, we need a higher, more robust view of what's happening through preaching and sacrament in our churches. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we are driving people uh, towards uh, more uh, direct, imminent experiences uh, with God. When preaching is reduced to teaching, and the sacraments are reduced to object lessons. Where is God? What is God actually doing here and now in our midst? And so that's, I'm going to focus on that tomorrow. Thank you, Michael. Would you like to join me in thanking Michael? That was a, a great little segue into advertising our talk for tomorrow, <laughs> nine o'clock, same place. Uh, do come along for that. It should be fantastic.
just following our close here, there's morning tea downstairs. And if you're visiting us, you are most welcome to stay for morning tea. We'd love for that to happen and to meet some of our students and for us to meet you too. Now let's close our time together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you give the Holy Spirit to us. We thank you that uh, you have uh, broken into this evil age with this, the new age. And we thank you for the uh, cosmic scope of the new creation to come, as well as uh, the personal reality in each of us who believe. Uh, Father, we pray that these truths might, as we go about our lives, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.